Um, good afternoon. My name is Matt Tadlock. I'm a Navy trauma surgeon, and I'm one of the two vice presidents for the AAST Military Liaison Committee. I'll be moderating today with Matt Martin, our other vice president. I'll have him introduce himself in a minute. Um, this is our third webinar um, dealing with military-civilian partnerships. Um, today, we're going to focus on those military members that are in, currently embedded or recently embedded in military civilian partnerships. We have a great panelist across the three services for you. And um, I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves and where they're embedded. And we'll go from there with questions. First, uh, John Ruggiero. Hey, I'm uh, Commander John Ruggiero, uh, Navy trauma surgeon currently embedded at uh, the partnership with Cook County Trauma in Chicago. Prior to that, I did my training civilian at Henry Ford in Michigan, and then was actually stationed in uh, Great Lakes, Chicago at the Naval Hospital there, and actually benefited from the military civilian partnership taking call down at Cook when I was just a general surgeon. Then uh, went on to do training at Cook County for surgical critical care and trauma, and then stayed on now to run the partnership where we're doing a sustainment program and clinical training for our ERSS platform prior to deployment. Awesome, great. Um, let's see, Brian Gavitt, tell us. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Brian Gavitt, uh, active duty Air Force. Uh, so I did my uh, residency at a partnership between Travis Air Force Base and UC Davis, uh, where I did my residency fully embedded at UC Davis, did my fellowship at LA County USC, and then was fully embedded uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, through the Sea Star Cincinnati program uh, as one assignment. And then uh, was assigned overseas to a MILSIV partnership uh, in Abu Dhabi for the last four years. I just PCS back stateside and currently at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, at the medical center there and uh, working with our MILSIV partnerships locally in Dayton uh, from here on out. All right, next we have Valerie Sams. Hi, uh, Colonel Valerie Sams. I'm the uh, site director for um, C-Star Cincinnati, which you just heard uh, Colonel Gavitt mentioned, which is the Center for Sustainment of Trauma and Readiness Skills. It's one of the three main original C-STARS platforms that the Air Force developed for um, deployment readiness training. Um, our program here at Cincinnati is focused on the Critical Care Air Transport Validation course. So um, the other major sites for um, C-STARS include Baltimore and St. Louis as some of the oldest. Uh, we have some new ones coming online uh, with some different focus areas, but the other platforms focus on the ground piece um, and it allows rotators to rotate clinically. Here, uh, our rotators and students validate through a simu high fidelity simulation course for um, deployment uh, in, in a CCAT or critical care air transport capacity. Uh, all of our cadre that teach that course are fully embedded clinically here and include uh, intensivists of uh, a variety of um, all types, as well as some emergency medicine anesthesia critical care and emergency medicine nurses and respiratory therapists. Um, as background, I'm a trauma critical care surgeon, uh, was formerly line in the Air Force, Was the uh, went through residency uh, training on the civilian side, and then uh, came back on active duty as the first Air Force fellow at BAMC, where Brian was uh, gracious enough to leave me in, at Brook Army Medical Center for nine years, where I um, served the last three years as the trauma medical director before moving to Cincinnati last summer. So thank you. All right, thank you. And then next we have Matt Eckert. Uh, Matt Eckert, I'm an Army trauma critical care surgeon embedded at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, been here three years now this month. Um, I was kind of the first person to start this partnership um, at, for the clinician level. And uh, so we have embedded, embedded neurosurgeons surgeon, embedded anesthesia providers, uh, multiple emergency medicine physicians, uh, nurses in the SICU and the ER, and then quite a number of rotating medics, uh, general surgeons, which actually they're all trauma critical care surgeons now. Um, and uh, the partnership has grown a little bit every year. So, Awesome. Thank you. And then I'll have my co-moderator, Matt Martin, introduce himself. And then he's also at a, at a site of a Navy partnership, and he can talk a little bit about that. Matt? Yeah, hi, this is Matt Martin. I'm a uh, trauma surgeon, uh, former military, retired Army. Uh, I'm now at uh, Los Angeles County so the USC Medical Center, although now our name has changed. We're now Los Angeles General Hospital. Um, but we have a longstanding uh, MCP program here with uh, the Navy uh, called the Navy Trauma Training Center. 
Um, it's a uh, program where there's a group of embedded uh, core faculty, including trauma surgeon, emergency medicine, anesthesia, uh, some admin personnel, and then there's a continuous series of uh, rotating teams that come through here uh, and undergo didactic simulation exercises. And then they also uh, have a clinical piece where they shadow on call. Great, thanks. All right, well, let's get started with our first question. And I always like to ask this in these kind of venues, you know, far forward deployed, the, the bulk of the, the surgeons anyway that are doing trauma care and role twos tend to be general surgeons. Um, and so we're often further back, at least trauma surgeons are in role threes. And so um, I, I want to ask each of you, it, do you have general surgeons embedded there um, in, as part of your partnership? And I know John does. So we'll start with John. And, 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 and John, talk a little bit about your experience as a general surgeon at Cook, and then talk about how the, the partnership there is structured and how that's working for the general surgeon there. And then we'll go, go to another panelist. Yeah, sure. So like I mentioned, we are currently running an ERSS essentially training program where we have a full ERSS team that's stationed here. Um, in addition to myself and a nurse who's my uh, assistant or my AOIC running the program. And that team's here for a year prior to deployment. And the OIC of that team is a general surgeon. So kind of how his role fits is he kind of he takes call essentially at a fellow level call. So he has supervision that's in-house because he's not uh, board certified in critical care. Um, but as he's gone on throughout this year, that kind of has been extrapolated into him having some more uh, aut aut autonomous call where he's not really, he's kind of on his own in the front room and managing things. The only time he really needs someone to back him up is in the ICU. And when he's going to the operating room, he essentially just has to let the attending know that, you know, he's going to the operating room just for the way it just has to do with the way the credentials were done. But like, like you mentioned, prior to my fellowship, I benefited from this as well. When I was stationed at Great Lakes, I was going down to cook and doing about two to three calls a month as a general surgeon in that same role as more of a fellow role where I had backup should I need it. Um, and that was more graduated in responsibility throughout that time, but pretty seamless as far as getting him in and getting in the reps and sets. I think I did call with him the last, like last Monday, and he had a uh, iliac vein, iliac artery injury, and didn't really need anybody to scrub in and help with him. So, pretty amazing for a general surgeon to be getting that experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, any other panelists have either current or anecdotal experiences with you know general surgeons through through the the military civilian partnership that you participated in? So I'll start with Brian. Any comments there? Yeah, so <clears throat> previously when I was at Cincinnati, we had some general surgeons there and I'll let, um, I'll let Colonel Sams kind of talk more about that. Um, but typically um, at the level one trauma centers, a lot of times what happened was there was a structure where when a general surgeon was taking a call, one of the trauma surgeons was covering SICU or backup uh, to provide SICU backup. And that was um, kind of the case there. At the most recent partnership I was at internationally, it was a little bit of a different setting where we were in a program that the trauma call was shared between uh, general surgeons and trauma surgeons. Um, and so it was a little bit different and, and uh, kind of a little bit not applicable in that sense. But from the military side, we only sent uh, trauma surgeons over there for that particular partnership. At Wright Pat, where I'm at now, um, we have um, general surgeons rotating downtown in partnerships, but not uh, currently at the trauma center. Over. Okay. Colonel Sands, anything to add to that? Yeah. Uh, you know, just like Colonel Gavitt mentioned, um, the University of Cincinnati had some embedded general surgeons in their partnership uh, that predated my arrival here, but I knew of them. I had actually deployed with them. Both of them that were here um, were deployed at the same time I was, so I knew them. Um, but I think some of the challenges, as Brian alluded to, is that the structure, the ACS structure that they have did require an extra staffing, you know, to be on call with them, uh, the way their staffing model runs, you know, with the, the full service. And they also cover a level three here as part of their healthcare system, which covers all of uh, not just acute care surgery, but trauma and the ICU. So um, if they if that general surgeon were to work up there, which I think is a great experience, there still has to be a backup intensivist um, on with them. So. Um, just hasn't really uh, been a sustainable thing here. Not that I don't think it could be, um, but I think those are the inherent challenges. Okay. 
And then Colonel Eckert, anything to add to that? I know you don't have general surgeons embedded now, but you had a number that come through and ended up doing fellowship there. Yeah, we started with uh, some general surgeons from uh, Fort Liberty rotating periodically. And then um, for, for one reason or another, actually all of them went on to do critical care fellowships. So either here or at Duke. So now that they're all now uh, boarded in critical care and they rotate, um, we just added a second embedded critical care surgeon full-time um, just, just this week, obviously. Um, so it has, it, it has worked in the past. It is, I think every institution has its own, you know, policies and, uh, kind of quirks to work out for how to manage it, but it probably worked a little easier because we had one of our own UNC faculty who is not critical care trained, but it actually runs our abdominal wall reconstruction, but within our division, um, would take call, uh, for trauma periodically and would have a backup. So that sort of, I think precedent was set. So, um, you always have a backup of something somebody from the ICU side uh, that can help you out, but it, it's doable. And but then one more, oh, go ahead. Matt, before they got their critical care fellowship though, what were they letting those general surgeons do independently? Yeah, um, so they would rotate typically with, you know, a handful of the, the full faculty and they, you know, obviously they're not billing, um, but they were operating kind of, I would say at the fellow that technically have visiting faculty privileges and they could do pretty much anything that the full-time faculty attending was willing to let them, you know, take part in. And um, so with, with a training program with fellows and chief residents, obviously it's, it's a little bit of, you know, situational read the room and, and find a way to be a, you know, an educator as opposed to taking over the case and whatnot. But um, I don't think we ever had any real problems with that. So and then another, one more question, and I'll, I'll turn it over. I'll put you on the spot. So Commander Aguero, your opportunity to do this, did that help in retention for you, for the Navy? And then for Colonel Eckert, can you speak to that with the groups that were able to both rotate through there, get a fellowship at a place they liked and, and go on? Can both of you speak to whether that may or may not have impacted retention, service retention? Yeah, I'd say 100% it affected my retention. I mean, it... I already knew the system. I had been working there already and a spot came open in the military match and already had the kind of networking done at the place where I was at, that it was an easy move into a fellowship position. So it, and it definitely, I don't know if I would have done a fellowship having to go back to fellow pay after military pay. I mean, I guess that's probably the only time you're making more as a military surgeon than <laughs> active duty than not. So definitely helped in my retention for sure. Yeah, I, I think I could confidently speak for the other folks that came through here and trained. They, they were, that was definitely part of a positive feature for their retention uh, on active service um, and allowed them to do a lot of things um, operationally that they needed to, to kind of expand their career and capabilities. So I think it was a positive all around and from the, from the university side as well. Yeah, and Matt, I'll jump in. And also from the Air Force side, I think that is one of our big uh, features uh, that uh, that helps retention. 85% of Air Force trauma surgeons are fully embedded at CIV partnerships, um, and uh, that significantly helps our ability to retain people, keep them happy, keep them advancing in an academic career, uh, and uh, kind of get the full spectrum um, of uh, trauma surgery in, in pretty robust centers. Uh, it makes a big difference. And and I'll, I'll hop on here too. I was just thinking through this uh, the last few days. Um, one of the challenges with the surgeons, the general surgeons that were embedded here also is that, you know, in order for them to be a general surgeon, have a general surgery practice, it was really challenging for them to kind of have that good, consistent, you know, clinic presence, follow up, all that when they had other obligations. So they're not just embedded here to be a surgeon, they're embedded here with another mission, uh, which is to teach the course. So there's, there's some military obligation there that kind of pulls them away. And I know we'll probably get into that a little bit later, but um, that was also one of the challenges to having general surgeons. Now, I think having a general surgeon fully embedded that doesn't have those obligations would probably work much better. All right. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add in it from our, from the Navy Trauma Training Center here, we continuously have general surgeons rotating. They'll, they'll generally take call with one of the military cadre who has full privileges here. Uh, and then they let them do as much or as little as they're comfortable with. The, the other nice thing they've been able to do is because, because they're rotating with their entire team, 
So they have an anesthesia provider, you know, an OR nurse, a circulator, a surgeon. Um, they will they will staff and run an OR uh, usually on the weekends. That's that's on their own, which the institution likes because we're always short of surgical teams. Um, so they've allowed them to run an OR usually on Saturdays, and then we'll just we'll just book cases into that OR, and it lets their whole team uh, operate together, and lets the general surgeons who are rotating. Uh, be the primary surgeons for those cases. Awesome. All right, I'll turn the next question over to you, Matt. Yeah. So, and uh, and Val already got into this. So, our next question is uh, obviously these people, uh, the embedded uh, personnel, they have multiple missions. Uh, they're not just there to be a you know a full time uh, trauma surgeon or acute care surgeon for that facility. So, and sometimes the the leadership or your colleagues don't really understand that. Um, so, how, how do you how do you uh, help the, your civilian partners and your leadership understand uh, the other roles you have, and that you might be a 0.5 FTE for them, or even less, depending on the roles you have? Um, and why don't we start with uh, with you, Val? Yeah. So this was one of the things that I knew uh, was going to be a challenge for me coming here. Um, was to ensure that there, you know, you don't really want animosity. Uh, you know, there have been ebbs and flows of that in the past, depending on um, the staff that were here and um, their kind of other obligations as well. So I think for me, it's just transparency. I just, I actually am on, I sit on the scheduling committee so that I'm a, uh, in the discussion for how all the faculty are scheduled for the trauma schedule anyway, um, which helps them understand kind of the course obligations and the military obligations of our, our surgeons. Um, and then the other thing is just being fully transparent with my own schedule. Uh, you know, as the course director, I, I'm still, you know, if you asked Dr. Pritz, we're 0.6, it's really like 0.75 FTE. But, um, you know, as, as the course director and then having some other military obligations, um, it is a full schedule for me. So when I'm transparent with them, with my weekly, you know, when we submit our six month calendar of when we're available, I'm very transparent about um, what my other obligations and trips and meetings and um, things are. Uh, I have been able to work with our cadre team to say, you know, based on uh, our individual roles within the program as instructors, if we have administrative roles within the program or leadership roles within the program, we have adjusted our uh, course obligations to match that because so we can keep our clinical obligations constant. So for the single boarded uh, physician, you know, they're about a 0.3 to 0.5 FTE, uh, depending on where they work. And for the nurses and RTs, we've even established some full-time equivalency uh, metric for them as well to meet their shifts. And then for the, the surgeons we're, we're, and the dual boarded uh, critical care folks, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely a 0.5 or better. So everything is kind of shifted. So it's about managing expectations of the clinical departments, which I meet with. Um, and also managing the expectations amongst the other cadre. So there is some imbalance there of what the um, different specialties can cover in each of those arenas. But trying to keep that clinical standard fairly well set is very important. All right. And uh, how about you, Brian? Yeah, I think, you know, I think Colonel Sam's hit on kind of one of the key points on this is that um, there has to be clear communication and expectation management. And I think one of the things that um, that uh, that we've found successful, I think in the Air Force and a lot of our MILSIV partnerships is to make sure that we're trying to, as much as possible, clearly communicate with our civilian sites um, on what they should expect as a baseline. So for example, if two trauma surgeons are assigned to an institution, being clear upfront that you have two individuals that are filling one FTE, and that the baseline that it will provide is one FTE. And each site has its own definition for what an FTE is. I think we're all pretty aware of that. Um, and then, you know, if, uh, if, they're, if both are present on site and are able to work and can cover extra duties, that's great. But I think that that expectation management on the front end for what, um, for what we will contribute, I think is important. And then as things come up, you know, when we have to, go do some of the random tests and other sorts of things that uh, that we do for the military that come up last minute with no warning. 
Um, those sorts of things covering in between the cadres uh, is a useful sort of thing to do. Um, and that's the other thing that we generally try to do in the Air Force is we try not to have single surgeon MILSIV partnerships, try to have a minimum of two with a, with a general baseline um, commitment of one FTE towards the institution. Over. All right, and, and that's great. So then that, that lead into, I think you, John. So you're, you're the only trauma surgeon. You're at a single trauma surgeon, right? Correct. And I'm not sure what your additional military requirements or missions are. So, so how much of an FTE are you for them and, and how do you handle that, especially being a single trauma surgeon? Yeah, so I mean, I think we're a relative, we're a relatively young, uh, fully embedded uh, partnership. So when we established it at the beginning, it was pretty clear that we actually have it in the MOU that everyone on the, in the included in the partnership is a 0.8 FTE. Um, and, you know, we don't run any courses, like there's no one rotating through in addition to our uh, cadre and embedded folks. So we're not having a lot of obligations outside of our normal day-to-day -day work and then whatever military training is. And I'll say that, you know, the expectations were set from the beginning for the institution and they're on board with it to the point where they understand that when we're scheduled, we're actually just added people, except for myself. And um, the, even the nurses are just added people to the um, to the pool when it comes to staffing. So they're not included in the actual schedule a lot of times, as a, mostly just the surgeon and or myself and the general surgeon, everyone else is a bonus. So at, they understand that anytime one of us or all of us could be pulled to do something else and it wouldn't affect their day-to-day -day operations. So I think, as someone else mentioned, I think just having that expectation set from the beginning when you're doing these partnerships is key so that everyone's on the same page moving forward. Hey, hey, John, can I know a little bit about, you know, the initial discussions for where you're at. And so my understanding is, you know, the first nine months to a year, it was pretty clear that the seven members of that surgical team, their primary responsibility is to be there and clinical and and then after that nine to 12 months, then they can do their pre-deployment training and then go deploy. But they have almost a solid year to get to be clinically, you know, clinically uh, embedded and do their training. And then they're worldwide deployable. Is that kind of how it's set up? Is that correct? That's correct. For the first, I think, nine to 10 months, when you look at the FTRP or whatever, I think they're, it's spelled out. They're untouchable, essentially. They're in a non-deployable status while they're doing their initial onboarding um, and ramp up essentially to get fully immersed. So they're untouchable essentially. And I have to say it, it has a lot to do with our institution, but also our parent command Great Lakes. There's never been an ask or question to pull anyone out of the civilian partnership up to the MTF to cover or do anything at all. So it's actually worked out very well. We're essentially on our own plan down there, which has worked out very well for everyone's clinical um, experience. I'll note that that required expectation management on the on the the sponsoring MTF side of things too. Correct. Um, over. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and how about you, Matt? Uh, as as somebody who's had a, a another military job where you have to disappear frequently uh, and sometimes on short notice, how did you handle that with the, the leadership there? And uh, I mean, obviously, they want to have some kind of continuity and ability to to count on you as one of their faculty members. Um, so I think as as Brian and Val said, you know, the, the communication, the transparency is the key to this. And you know, you kind of, uh, I think, you bank social capital by being around and working hard when you're, you know, knowing that those things are going to happen. Um, if you're really fortunate, like I am, and you have amazing partners, then they get it and um, they're willing to to be there for you when it happens. Um, I don't know about the other partnerships. I, I'll say myself included and all the Army people here have all deployed out of the MILSA partnership, um, all, every, every single one. So it's, um, you know, it happens. We were clear with the partner up front, with the institution, with the departments, the divisions that this can happen. And um, to my knowledge, it hasn't caused any great, any great problems. Um, I think that part of that is, you know, you're you're a good steward and citizenship at the institution when you're here working hard, and uh, that helps keep up your end. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, I think it's definitely a balancing act because if you completely sell it as 
just think of us as extra personnel, you know, don't count on us. Uh, you'll never become truly embedded and part of the team, but they all obviously have to know you also have military responsibilities. Uh, all right, I'll turn it back over to Matt for the next question. Yeah, and I guess we'll start with John and then we'll go with everybody else. But what challenges have you had? Because you're new, this is new over the last year and getting the other specialties trained. You know, you're, you're, you know, Cook County has a unique sort of system in terms of their trauma unit is sort of, I guess, self-sufficient and like the emergency department separate. So are you having any challenges getting like your ER physician and ER shifts and other providers, um, you know, clinical care relative into their specialty? Yeah, I'll say we actually haven't had many challenges. And I think a lot of it has to do with just the way our um, trauma units set up where we're completely isolated from the emergency room. So we have essentially complete control over our schedule in the front room when it comes to all the trauma activations and who's taking care of what. So typically, you know, on the ERSS team, for those that aren't familiar, we have a general surgeon, an ER doctor, a PA, um, a nurse, surgical tech, respiratory tech, and what did I miss? ER, uh, CRNA. So when we make the schedule, we usually revolve everyone's schedule around the general surgeon when he's on call. And we typically try and do, in the beginning, we tried to do one or two month, times a month, but now we're at a point where we're doing, I think this next month, they have five team call days that are on. So essentially every, the ER doc will do a uh, 12 hour shift in the ER during the day, and then pop over to the trauma bay and do the rest of the call rest of the 24 hour shift over in the trauma unit as essentially the lead resuscitationist in the front room. And then all the other members are on call at the same time, which it works out well when we own it because the ERSS makeup, we don't have any quad zero corpsmen on the team. So our surgical tech and our respiratory tech will essentially just do quad zero regular corpsman stuff in the front room. And if we have a case that goes up to the operating room, the way the staffing works out, and like I mentioned earlier, we're bonus, that nurse, ER doc, everyone else is not really factored into the schedule. So everyone can then move up to the operating room and we're running a whole Navy OR on call days. So it's worked out really well. I'll have to say my wife's an ER physician and she doesn't like doing 24 hour shifts. So is that working okay? It is. I would say if there's one person that has an issue with it, it's the ER doc, not only doing his 12 days a month, you know, so, but I, he's come around because when everyone else is doing it, he just does it. So, all right. Yeah. That, as you suspect that, it, that was a little sticking point sometimes. But I had to remind him on deployment, it's not shift work. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, Val, any, anything to add to that? Yeah. You know, so, just some interesting challenges we've had here as we come out of COVID. Um, you know, we have nurses and RTs and our physicians for the most part get great experience. I mean, there's no uh, hesitation from the emergency department or anesthesia for our embedded cadre to get shifts. I mean, they, they, they'll take more. Um, the uh, critical care anesthesia, we have a couple of those folks here. Uh, it's a, you know, very unique, um, uh, you know, cardiothoracic ICU, ECMO kind of program. So they're, they're pretty well embedded there. The, the challenge for us most, mostly is with um, nurses and RTs and making sure they're not getting shifts, you know, in the PACU or in the step-down units and, and those sorts of things. The nurses have some unique challenges because of the union. Um, coming out of COVID, a lot of contract nursing was hired, obviously, now we're, we're used, utilized, and now uh, they're in the process of kind of rehiring regular staff. Um, so there's some competition there for proctoring and who gets the good patients and the good shifts. Um, so making sure that our, you know, we did have to reset some expectations of our military members that we're not Monday through Friday day shift people, um, that we can take shifts at night and on the weekends. We've also um, opened the door to expand our ER docs and the trauma surgeons obviously already cover the level three and uh, there's an ICU and ER there that our nurses and um, respiratory therapists are, are actually welcome to do. So we're expanding their credentials to cover that facility. So it just requires a lot of uh, communication and the nurse turnover and the leadership turnover within the civilian institution does require, you know, frequent engagement to make sure that everybody is, understands that this is a mutually beneficial relationship and finding that mutual benefit. Um, it can't just be all one-sided. Patriotism only gets you so far. 
um, there has to be some benefit to the civilian side as well. And they have to look out for their own staff and, and making sure that we're not encroaching upon their own experience. Let's see, uh, Brian or Matt, anything to add to, depending on you know the, the structure of things where you have, are at or recently been? Yeah, I'll jump in real quick. The so um, I didn't I didn't mention earlier on, but I chair the Milsit Partnership Working Group for the Defense Health Agency, and one of the consistent things that we've been seeing um, is that as a as a general rule, um, it's fairly easy to get providers that can bill uh, embedded in facilities. Uh, in general, uh, facilities are pretty happy to have people who can generate revenue for them. I think the challenge is like what Colonel Sams mentioned, is the nurses and techs. Uh, and that's a challenge for two reasons. Number one, the institution doesn't really generate a revenue benefit off of that. You can also have the problems with unions, those sorts of things. But when you flip it to the military side, the MTFs have a significant shortage of both techs and nurses. Uh, and uh, a lot of them get tapped for additional duties like running gate guard duty or motor pool or all of these other duties that are completely misaligned with what they're actually supposed to be doing for their expeditionary scope of practice. So you really have the techs and the nurses uh, getting, getting kind of stuck the most with being pulled out of the clinical setting. And I think the biggest challenge is, is number one, the MTFs in the military um, you know, right-sizing the staffing of the nursing and technical uh, technicians uh, in the institution, and then also, you know, pairing and partnering our techs and nurses to work with the with the providers that are already embedded in those relationships. So, it's kind of a it's kind of a two-step sort of challenge there. Over. And then Matt, I don't. Do you have anything to add to to that or? No, I think, um, yeah, it, probably every institution faces some of the same challenges, so I won't repeat those. Yeah, there's a follow-on question in the chat but before I turn it over to Matt Martin. And and this is an interesting question because I know some places that, that this is the case, so I, I'll bring it up. Do any of you work in MCPs where the local surgeons are paid by shift-based compensation so that when you're taking a shift, potentially impacts their compensation? Oh. Yeah, I, I can say for my institution, I mean, we're, we're just part of the schedule. Um, we, the civilian surgeons that I work with have a compensation, compensation package um, that includes, you know, uh, RVUs, productivity metrics. I'm not sure. I mean, there's a thousand page document to explain their compensation package, but um, it, there is some um, shift work that is voluntary that is compensated. Um, but again, we're just part of the normal schedule, so it really doesn't impact our uh, partnership. I know where I work at UCSD, the division is paid as a whole, so I'm not taking anything away by being on call. And I know I, I, there's it locally in Southern California, I know at UC Irvine, where the unit I am has a number of people embedded, they're always paired with, with one of the local attending, so that's not an issue. Yeah. Anybody else have any other comments? I'll yeah, just say one more thing. I'm sorry. I just thought, oh. um, just to clarify too, uh, they are uh, paid, the civilian surgeons are paid based on their, you know, productivity, based on the sliding scale of productivity or whatever. So there is some conscious effort by the division cha chair to keep the staffing model appropriate so that, you know, if we can't just bring an infinite number of surgeons in here and then not impact yeah. their productivity. So um, there is some effort to keep that fairly stable. Any other comments with that add-on sort of question? But it's not an issue at uh, our institution. It's a county hospital and purely salary-based. So they're happy for an extra person in the call pool. So, okay. And then I think somebody else was going to say something. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, you know, most of the big MCPs are at major academic trauma centers where it's, there's not a whole lot of fighting for shifts and, and your, your reimbursement is primarily based on shifts, but that does become an issue when we talk about a lot of level twos or community centers. Um, like even in San Diego, you know, you know, Matt Tadlock that uh, the Navy surgeons would work there and, and that's how the surgeons make their money. It's all based on shift pay. So that, that just has to be factored in, uh, with the civilian institution and whether 
whether they have enough shifts to offer and whether that's going to be fine with their their surgeons either losing that reimbursement or but at a lot of places it it basically helps them because they don't have to hire a full FTE. They have a, a couple of these surgeons taking the shifts and that essentially fills that spot for them. Yeah, I know a number of, you know, you know, tentative partnership discussions where it's really hard to get past that because they're not academic centers and figuring out the billing is challenging. Um, all right, I'll turn over to you, Matt, for the next question. Um, all right. So why don't we talk a little bit about scope of practice? And, and somebody already brought that up. Because um, obviously, I think the, the big mission here is to keep surgeons ready for deployment um, and expeditionary skills. So, so the question is, how relevant is what you're doing at your MCP uh, to your deployment skill set? Uh, would you say it's complete? It, it gives you complete readiness. Are there are there areas uh, where it's not fully preparing you, or uh, skills that you or your rotators are missing out on, like thoracic or vascular, uh, et cetera? So, why don't we start with uh, with Brian? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So, um, the partnership that I just left uh, was an international MILSIV partnership in the UAE, and I would say that. Um, our scope of practice uh, on call with trauma was uh, was extraordinarily broad and useful. The challenge that we had was that we were dealing with a 95% blunt uh, trauma. Uh, so a lot of, uh, frankly, the, the benefit is that the resuscitations are pretty brutal. Um, a lot of pelvic packing, a lot of, um, a lot of operations that are um, less satisfying, more painful. Um, was kind of the was kind of the general situation for the trauma cases that existed. Uh, a lot of good general surgery, a lot of good acute care surgery. In fact, those cases outnumbered the trauma cases. But I felt like that provided a fairly good uh, scope of practice. Um, the program is changing; it's in transition right now. Um, and there's uh, as they bring in more subspecialties to that particular hospital, things like thoracic. Um, are starting to be um, uh, sectioned off so that they belong to uh, the subspecialists as opposed to trauma on the elective basis in the emergent uh, and urgent basis. Obviously, we um, do what we need to do. Over. All right. How about you, Matt? Uh, it's good. I'd say, you know, it's a 95% solution. Um, you know, the, the institutional way some of the practice happens. So emergency thoracic, you know, is, is no issue. Um, delayed bats, et cetera, things of that nature handled by cardiothoracic service. Vascular is primarily vascular, but I've never had anyone give me an issue when I wanted to scrub and do those cases with them and, and carry on that continuity of care. Um, I think they, the, one of the strengths of the program is there's enough trauma here, but the best part about it is there is tremendous volume of complex emergency general surgery, which I personally think is more beneficial um, for deployed surgeons. And so I, that's a personal opinion, but um, there's no shortage of that and I can free to do whatever I want. So it's great. All right. How about you, Val? Yeah. Yeah. Similar to Matt, actually, probably 95% um, same. I mean, we have very collaborative uh, subspecialists, subspecialists here. So you know, it's not uncommon for us to start the vascular case while they're working their way in. And then, uh, you know, we're welcome to stay and, and continue the case with them as long as we're not back down in the trauma bay. Um, you know, we're, we're working on kind of inching our way into the ECMO world a little bit here. Uh, that's primarily ran by critical care anesthesia and cardiothoracic surgery. That's a pretty longstanding um, program here. So we're, we're working on that. We are both of our critical care anesthesia intensivists work in that. So we're, we're working our nurses and surgeons into that as well, hopefully. Um, I, yeah. And, and I, I also agree with Matt that uh, I don't think I appreciated, I, I'd forgotten, I guess I did my civilian uh, residency in, in Tennessee and it was great, great residency, high volume general surgery. Um, but I think being at BAMC, taking care of really healthy beneficiaries for a long time, I'd forgotten how sick some of these acute care emergency general surgery patients can be. And I, I totally agree with Matt. I mean, that, that is some bang for your buck right there. And, and Cincinnati has um, a really robust ACS uh, program, surgeon or uh, practice. So it's, it's, it's actually, I would say 95%. All right, John. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, just the nature of our trauma uh, unit, we're about 30% penetrating trauma. So high amount of operative trauma. 
Um, so I'd say it pretty much mirrors anything that you would want for a deployed surgeon. Um, anything that's done emergently or even the delayed fashion when it comes to uh, thoracic is handled by our service. The only time is typically if there's a stable vascular patient that'll get turf to vascular sometimes because we're busy running our own trauma unit. So we don't have time to disappear to do a complex bypass. But certainly when there's an emergent situation, someone's exsanguinating, we do the initial exposure, get them stabilized, and then we'll, some, we'll sometimes stay, we'll most of the time stand to assist in uh, doing the vascular repair with the vascular surgeon. But I'd say the only thing we're missing is uh, we don't do any ACS call. We're purely trauma at our institution, but I think our numbers are good enough and com the complexity of the take backs and, you know, multiple cases that these patients need kind of offloads the bread and butter lap coli hernias and appies that you would get at NTF. So. Is, is that a problem for your general surgeon, like being pulled away from their general surgery practice? I would say initially when uh, our surgeon came this time, he was a little hesitant about it. And when they started, they started in October. So it wasn't necessarily our busy months. So I think he was starting to get the itch of, I'm missing a lot of this general surgery practice, but I'd say within the last three months, he's, his kind of outlook and opinion has totally kind of changed because he's gotten a tremendously different last two to three months than he did at Hey, so, so John, so, so your emergency general surgery is covered by an entirely different group. That's correct. Okay. And that's just purely based on the politics of the hospital at the, at the current moment. Okay. And, and Brian, I know you're, you've not only been at these, but you're in charge of establishing these programs. And, and I think we are setting up some of these at institutions that are heavily blunt trauma and, and maybe much less operative or, what do you think about those places in terms of what kind of benefit the faculty get in, uh, for deployment skills and readiness? And what can they do to overcome that if they're at one of those places where it's primarily blunt trauma and it's much less operative volume? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the spots where we have folks that are primarily at uh, where it's uh, predominantly blunt trauma we typically have um, negotiated an agreement where they're working on the acute care surgery service and doing surgical critical care, and they get the full balance of kind of a full acute care surgery service. Um, I don't, from the, from the Air Force side, we don't have uh, the only partnership that's uh, significantly blunt trauma is the international MILSID partnership, which is really more of a joint mission between the three services. Um, the vast majority of all of our sites uh, are fairly high penetrating trauma, uh, and all of our sites from the Air Force uh, involve some amount of emergency general surgery and surgical critical care mixed in. And I think that's an important, uh, I think that's an important point that folks have hit on is uh, that general surgery maintaining the emergency general surgery skill set. I mean, we've you know, anybody who's deployed downrange, sure, we did a fair amount of trauma cases, but we also, you know, had, you know, I had uh, uh, sigmoid volvulus and kind of standard sorts of stuff that you see in general surgery come in uh, that you have to manage in an expeditionary setting. And so it's important to not lose that skill set and to, and to keep that uh, up over. All right, I'll turn it back over to you, Matt, for the next question. All right. Yeah, I have. Um, I guess we have ten more minutes, so I have. We'll have uh, talk about graduate medical ed education on sort of both sides of the coin. First, we'll. I guess we'll start with Matt and and the, you know, depending on the military treatment facility, the number of cases that residents are getting at their home NTF is decreasing. I think, you know, I know of one residency where sixty five percent of their cases are being done at at one of the civilian rotators for the military general surgery residents. So is it helpful? Is there synergy for when those military residents rotate at um, your civilian program where you're embedded? Does that help them with their development as a military surgeon? What kind of synergy is there? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I think it does. Um, I think it's unique and I'm definitely an advocate for having these partnerships near, you know, military residency programs for surgery in particular. But um, 
so that the surgeons from uh, the general surgery residents from Womack rotate through the surgical ICU. Um, they rotate through the burn service here. So they spend um, a number of months here in their first three years uh, of their training. And obviously that, that program just started three years ago. So it's been kind of neat that it's been paired at the same time as this partnership's grown. But um, it's great because I know their program director well, and I will occasionally give lectures down there and, um, you know, see and know their faculty and, and see those residents grow and come through the program. And um, while it's been it's been oddly timed this year where uh, a number of times I've been deployed, they've been in, in the SICU, but we've had a number of months where things have matched up well and um, it is rewarding and I think as the programs grow. Uh, that synergy is important. It's it's unique to have that layered relationship where, you know, that the referrals for complex surgery come from, you know, Womack, Fort Liberty to UNC or the Triangle area. Um, we're the regional trauma level one for their level three. Uh, their residents rotate with us. We have rotators from the base. So that kind of, I think, layered, you know, relationship uh, at multiple levels is is really important. Val, can you speak to that a little bit? I don't know the setup where you're at, but yeah, um, I'll probably have to defer to to Brian because we, okay. we don't have. Uh, I mean, we we typically have some military fellows intermittently that are trained here at the University of Cincinnati, which is good. But we don't have rotator military residents that are okay. not that are part of an MTF. I know Brian, you were a product of an integrated partnership at Davis, so I guess uh, what can you speak to about that? Yeah, I think I think the benefit of of kind of integrating GME into these relationships is really the context. You know, I think we all sat in a hotel room doing our oral boards at one point. They gave you a case and you asked for IR, sorry, not available. You asked for GI, sorry, not available. They're out of town. That's the expeditionary setting. And not just, you know, and I think focusing on that and drilling on that, you know, um, having trained with surgeons who, who were deploying routinely, um, it put a real um, kind of bit of context to what I needed to learn. In addition to kind of the basic level of surgery, what do you do when you don't have interventional radiology and all these resources? And it wasn't necessarily a formal curriculum. It was the stuff that you learn alongside somebody while you're operating on somebody. Hey, I saw something similar to this when I was in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever they deployed. And here's what I did differently. And those sorts of things always stuck with me. And uh, I found that particularly useful. So I think there's a real benefit, not just on the GME side, certainly embedding um, uh, residents, fellows uh, with folks who've uh, done the downrange mission, but frankly, also nurses and techs uh, to understand how, um, you know, in an in a austere setting, you're not going to have all the equipment you have, but what can you use instead? And how would you think about the situation differently? What's what's within the boundaries of creative and safe? Uh, and um, and I think those are really useful aspects. Um, so that again, you know, the JTS talks about it. Uh, is uh, you know we you know we don't want uh, we want to make sure that um, that uh, we don't lose the lessons learned from the last twenty years and have to relearn them again. So I guess on the other side of the graduate medical education coin, for various reasons, partnerships are easy at easier at academic centers for some of the reasons we've discussed. So uh, I guess we'll start with Val. Uh, is there a is there a neg how do you mitigate the potential negative impact to either trauma fellowship GME or general surgery GME for the civilian um, you know fellows and residents at your program where you're where you're embedded? Yeah. So um, is there an issue? It, it's not an issue here because our our uh, faculty are fully embedded. So they're just normal faculty. We don't have rotators. We don't have, uh, you know, military providers that are here for training purposes. So there's no real competition um, here. I mean, we're, we're just we're just regular faculty. There's no one on the schedule with us. We're not taken away from a chief resident or a fellow. We're actually training them. So um, not an issue here. Um, let's see who has rotators, I guess. I guess, John, you have a lot of rotators, but is that an issue there? I know you have fellows and 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 I think general surgery residents from various places rotating there. Yeah, so I think, you know, like we talked about earlier when we were talking about the specific civilian institutions, I think setting um, expectations at the beginning of a shift. Like for me, when I'm on as the trauma surgeon with the team that's on, I kind of set the expectation like, hey, if we have a case that's going to the operating room, 
my surgeon and his PA are going to be open in the patient. And then once the patient's open and packed, then you as the chief resident, I expect you to then come in and do the rest of the case. But I think it, it's a tightrope because, I mean, you can't find a level one trauma center that has robust operative experience at a non-teaching institution. If you could find that place, I think it'd be great. But I think finding that balance with the like the current residents and just having a discussion prior to certain procedures, just so there's a balance, because I think at least for our platform, it's very important for all the members to be cross-trained in different aspects. So getting our ER doctor into the operating room and opening a belly at least and packing an abdomen. And that's been able to be done. It just takes a little bit of upfront, me as the trauma surgeon that's on having a discussion with the residents like, hey, I'm not bumping you out of this case. My ER doc's going to come in and open the belly and then you're going to take over after he's done. So I think just setting those expectations has really made it kind of seamless at our institution, at least. Val, you raised your hand. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, you know, I'm just going to draw a little bit on my BAMC experience um, because we did have, you know, BAMC is thought of is simply a, a military platform, but it really is a huge uh, MILSIP partnership in San Antonio where we um, we work a lot with the university. Our residents and fellows uh, rotate back and forth across the across town. Um, so it is one of the uh, bigger uh, military civilian partnerships, just a little different than most people think about it. But I, I will say that uh, we had some experience with um, this trainee rotation kind of thing when when we tried to do Stark in San Antonio. We had the the uh, Roll Two training program that we did there for a couple of years, and it did require a lot of um, coordination with the program director and GME, and um, to make sure that the 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 team that was there training uh, didn't interfere with the, you know resident cases and uh, chief residents and fellows. So um, definitely, I think I think it goes back to what John was just saying. It just requires a little bit of expectation management, a little planning, um, so that everybody gets to maximize on the uh, experience. Um, Matt or Brian, uh, one more minute. Last words on this. I think I think from my view, the the spots that have had the the best success with uh, the rotational model are sites with an extraordinarily high trauma volume relative to the staffing. Um, and the, the higher that volume is, the more likely you are to be able to get rotators through. So I think from an Air Force, from the Air Force side of things, we focus generally our rotator model um, on sites that have that kind of super high uh, trauma volume, your Baltimore's, your Las Vegas, your um, you know, sites like that that can generate a huge amount of volume so that there's enough cases to go around for everyone. I think there's a real risk in trying to apply that model in the lower volume centers uh, because the, the lower that volume gets relative to the number of people fighting for it, then you get into trouble with GME, then you get into trouble with the institution. And I think that's, I think that's where your risk lies. Over. All right. Well, thank you. I, I think we're at time. Um, I'll... I guess I'll put Matt Martin on the spot. I want you want to close out and 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 uh, finish up for for today. I think you know we had four great panelists. I think this was a great discussion. There's more to talk about. Um, if people want another webinar like this to continue this on, maybe discuss controversies, please let us know. But um, Matt, any other final comments? Yeah, no. Well, one, thank the panelists for the great discussion, and I think. What one message that becomes very clear is all politics are local, right? So and every program will have its individual issues and politics, but but there are common threads that run throughout all of them. Like, you know, are you taking cases away from the chief resident, and are there going to be complaints, and and just all of that needs to be anticipated and and thought out and dealt with before you start, because what you don't want to have is your you've got your program started and suddenly the program directors come to you because they've got 10 complaints from the residents because um, you hadn't worked that out ahead of time. But uh, I really want to thank the panelists and, uh, and Matt Tadlock, my co-moderator. And uh, hopefully we will have uh, some additional uh, of these webinars talking about this uh, issue. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're going to sign out. And thanks again to our panelists and, and Matt Martin. All right. Take care, everyone.